Hey everybody, it's Drags. It's episode 244 of Patriots Beat on the CLNS Media Network. You can find us at our brand new website, www.clnsmedia.com. Follow us on Twitter, of course, at CLNS Media. All Patriots and NFL-related uh, material, you can give us a follow at Patriots CLNS. And of course, Give us a follow on Facebook at facebook.com slash CLNS Media. I want to welcome back to the podcast Doug Kide of Nesson.com. Doug did an outstanding job, I thought, and this is something I want to get right into. Uh, the roster projection, it's never too early uh, once the uh, – Free agency is uh, fully underway, and the draft is complete to get into a 53-man roster projection version uh, 0.5. I won't even go 1.0, Doug. How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. How are you doing, Craig? I'm doing well. Um, I, I got to tell you, some of these uh, names on the roster projection uh, uh, caught me by surprise. Uh, namely, we'll start with the running back because I know you were down at uh, Foxborough talking to Jeremy Hill uh, on Tuesday. You have not only Mike Gillisley, which I don't think surprises people, but you have Jeremy Hill not making the uh, team. You have four running backs, Brandon Bolden, obviously special teams, Rex Burkhead, uh, Sony Michelle, and James White, but Jeremy Hill out. Why? Roster spots are just at a premium, and I'm not sure if the Patriots will be willing to keep five running backs on their roster again this season. They did last year, but I felt like that was kind of a, a special circumstance where you know, Dion Lewis's contract was coming up and they wanted to keep around as many talented backs as possible. I think that this year it's going to come down to Brandon Bolden, Jeremy Hill, or Mike Gillisley. In this situation, I just had Bolden giving them more special teams ability, uh, more versatility that way. But I could easily see it shaking out any of those three ways. But I just gave the nod to Bolden because he actually – can provide a little bit on offense if he's needed, and he still provides that special team spark. All right, and Jeremy Hill, I thought, uh, was pretty uh, straight up when he said uh, he accepts the competition. When he talks about the competition and wel- welcoming that competition, uh, this train, you know, obviously the summer and uh, into the fall, um, what uh, was your read of Jeremy Hill um, on Tuesday at Foxborough? Yeah, I thought he actually had some interesting things to say. He's definitely embracing the competition. He said that, you know, this is a very competitive group of running backs, which uh, obviously, like we were just saying with the with the roster projection, there's going to be some talented names left off the 53-man roster, barring any injuries. And another thing that he said that I thought was pretty interesting, I, I asked him about, you know, sharing the backfield because he's done that a lot in the past with the Bengals, with Gio Bernard and Rex Burkhead and, and Joe Mixon. And he really seemed to enjoy sharing the backfield with other running backs. He said that, you know, guys guys can get out there and, and touch the ball 400 times, but that's really not that great for your body. And Jeremy Hill basically said that, you know, you only get one body. You don't want to treat it poorly by taking on too many carries. So if he is asked to share the backfield with Sonny Michelle and James White and, and Rex Burkhead and some of these other guys, that will not be a problem for Jeremy Hill. See, I think, having obviously followed, uh, as I'm sure you're yeah. aware, uh, the Cincinnati scene very closely, I think uh, Jeremy Hill's got a little bit more left in the tank than Mike Gillisley, and I think uh, Jeremy Hill probably has a little bit more explosion. It was, what, just two, three years ago now um, that he came on as a rookie uh, with the Bengals, and he was a force. Yeah, I, I'm very interested to see what Jeremy Hill has, because he did have ankle surgery last season, and it seemed like that ankle was bothering him for the last couple of years. Uh, Kevin Duffy of MassLive.com actually was mentioning that today in the media workroom that he's had Jeremy Hill on his fancy team. And it seemed like every few snaps, he'd kind of be limping off the field and never looked fully comfortable on that ankle. So I'm interested to see what he looks like after having that ankle sur- surgery after being 100% because he was dominant as a rookie, but, he really hasn't regained that level of play since that time, it seems like. All right, let's move on, Doug, to the wide receiver spot. And um, I think the one name that jumps right off the page, and uh, I think you know the one I'm going toward, is Malcolm Mitchell. You have him not making the team. You have the rookie Braxton Berrios, uh, who was drafted uh, out of Miami, Julian Edelman, Chris Hogan, Jordan Matthews, Cordell uh, Patterson, and Matthew Slater all on it, but not Malcolm Mitchell. 
or Kenny Britt yeah, for that is, matter. Or Philip Dorsett. Yeah, this is with Mitchell, it's all about injuries. I will believe that Malcolm Mitchell will take the field in 2018 when I see it. Because last year, we were waiting all season for him to come off that the injured reserve, and it never happened. He, he didn't suffer a torn ACL last year, yet he still missed the entire year with a knee injury. That's extremely concerning. And I just, I'm not totally sure what the future holds for Malcolm Mitchell, but I'm not really expecting anything until I actually see him on, in, on a regular season game field. Until then, uh, my expectations are pretty much zero. All right, um, going to move on to the tight end group. Why does Jacob Hollister not make it, but Will Ty does? That was just such a tough position. I mean, Dwayne Allen, I think, is the most sure thing at tight end. Then it really came down to, to Ryan Izzo, Will Ty, Jacob Hollister. I think that with a full offseason under his belt with the Patriots, with a full you know practice squad season under his belt with the Patriots, I just think that Will Ty has more receiving upside than Jacob Hollister. And he has a lot more receiving production throughout his career as well. I mean, that was a, that was a starting tight end with the Giants. So I'm pretty intrigued to see what he can do in the Patriots offense you know, after having the whole offseason. Offensive line, uh, there was one name that didn't make it uh, that uh, surprised me, Adrian Waddle. So much talk and speculation has been given to the fact that Adrian Waddle is going to be one of the guys that competes for the left tackle spot. Uh, certainly has the experience. He has had a dinged-up shoulder here and there um, in you know his two years or uh, yeah, two plus seasons uh, with the Patriots, but uh, you do not have him making the the roster. Why? Yeah, that was actually I was surprised by that one that I actually cut with Adrian Waddle, and that just it's a numbers game. The Patriots added so many offensive tackles over the off season that did include re-signing with Adrian Waddle. He's on a one year, one and a half million dollar contract. It was a smart signing because it gave the Patriots some certainty there at offensive tackle, but. If you're banking on Isaiah Wynn making the roster, if you're banking on Trent Brown making the roster, if you're banking on Antonio Garcia making the roster and Marcus Cannon making the roster, that's four offensive tackles right there, and you don't really need a fifth one. So instead of keeping Adrian Waddle, who can only play offensive tackle, I kept Cole Crossan instead, who can play offensive tackle and guard. So we will see how that shakes out. We really don't know a lot about Cole Cross, and it seems like the Patriots like him. But if he didn't make any progress over the offseason and over last season when he was barely used, then Waddle probably would be a fifth tackle. But like I said, I don't know if you necessarily need a fifth tackle on your roster. Well, okay, let me ask you this, Doug. Um, Of the names uh, that, that we see on this roster, Antonio Garcia, Trent Brown, uh, who I think was a, a sneaky, really good pickup under the radar on uh, Friday um, on the day that the Patriots made three trades and moved all over the trade board uh, in rounds two and three. I thought he was a very nice pickup from the 49ers if he can keep his weight under control. Um, Trent Brown, Antonio Garcia, uh, or Isaiah Wynn, who starts at left tackle? I, I would say Isaiah Wynn right now, but that is going to be a, a really tough position battle over the summer, and it, it really depends on if Wynn can play left tackle in the NFL at his size because he is only six foot three. He's three hundred and two pounds, which is undersized. Um, he does have longer arms for his frame, but I, I, I think that he'll be the guy based on what he did in the SEC, based on what he did in college. I think he can take over those left tackle duties, but. If he can't, then you basically just go down the line. I think that Antonio Garcia probably would have the second best chance. After that, it probably would be Trent Brown. And then after that, I guess it would be Adrian Waddle as the fourth best chance to start at left tackle. Edge defenders. Um, you have Adrian Claiborne, Trey Flowers, Derek Rivers, Dietrich Wise, not uh, Gino Grissom, uh, not Eric uh, Lee. I guess no real shockers there, right? Yeah, I think that, you know, Keontae Davis, Davis. and Eric Lee both have upside there at that edge defender position, but I, I neither, neither one of them have done quite enough to earn a spot over any of those other guys or earn a spot over someone else at a different position. Defensive tackles, Malcolm Brown, Adam Butler, Lawrence Guy, Danny Shelton. You have Vince Valentine not making the team. 
Yeah, I think that, you know, they probably only need four defensive tackles on the roster, and it really comes down to Adam Butler or Vincent Valentine. And Vincent Valentine kind of does the same type of things as Danny Shelton and Malcolm Brown and uh, and Lawrence Guy. So I added a different body into that mix with, with Adam Butler. I think it's possible that they keep five defensive tackles, or maybe they just choose not to have that interior disruptor like Adam Butler on the roster. But Vincent Valentine didn't miss all of last season with a knee injury. I think that, you know, he's he's back to competing for a spot on this roster as he enters training camp this year just because he didn't do anything in his second year. Okay, this is going to be kind of a two-in-one um, question for you, Doug. And that is uh, the draft and the linebacking group. Uh, I think there was a consensus among observers of the Patriots that they had to get better. Uh, in their linebacking core. They certainly had to get deeper, and they did that, I thought. Uh, the Purdue uh, downhill pounder, as he's been uh, so <laughs> referenced in uh, many uh, draft neck uh, you know, analysis features, Jawan Bentley out of Purdue, uh, and Christian Sam. What do you make of those two linebackers that have been added uh, to a group that is suddenly, if it's healthy, pretty deep? Yeah, I, I like both players, actually. I think that the Juwan Bentley pick was kind of panned at the time just because a lot of people hadn't heard of him. But he does what he does. He's a good, like you said, a, a downhill thumper type of linebacker. He can fill in gaps. He, he can be explosive in, in kind of a 10-yard a space. I don't think he's going to contribute much in coverage, but I think that he could probably contribute a little bit in coverage similar to a Dante Hightower where – you know, if a running back's running in the flat and he catches the ball, then then Bentley will do a good job of stopping him for no gain beyond the point of catch. He's not going to be running 20 or 30 yards down the field to cover a tight end or a running back, though. And we'll even see how much he plays on third down and in passing situations. Um, it, with Christian Sam, he's a little bit more athletic. So Nick Sirius said that he's more of a weak side linebacker. Uh, we'll kind of see if, if one of those guys, if both those guys make the roster, uh, we'll see how they compete with Alandon Roberts during the course of, of training camp and preseason. I'm at the point where I kept John Bentley and Christian Sam on the roster over Alandon Roberts just because I think that we've seen everything that we have to see out of Alandon Roberts, right. whereas John Bentley and Christian Sam both have more upside as of right now at this moment. Obviously, all of that could change as we see them in practice during the spring and the summer. But for now, I just like the upside that the unknown presents more than what we know in Atlanta and Roberts. Okay, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the secondary because there really are no surprises. All the safeties you would expect are, are in that group. Patrick Chung, Nate Edmer, Deron Harmon, Devin McCourty, and Jordan Richards. Maybe Jordan Richards is a bit of a surprise, but he makes the team by default, right? Yeah, I mean, there's really no other safety that would make the roster over him like I considered having six cornerbacks and four safeties right. uh, with, with Duke Dawson and Cyrus Jones making it a cornerback because Duke Dawson can play a little bit of safety, maybe one pressed. But I don't know. I, I just see the team carrying five safeties. This, what was it, in like 2015 or 2013 when Bill Belichick had like nine safeties on the roster at one time? I just can't imagine him rolling with only four at the position. How big of an impact do you think Duke Dawson's going to have? Um. That's a good question. I, I think that, you know, the Patriots play so much in big nickel with Patrick Chung and Deron Harmon both on the field at the same time as Devin McCourty that a third cornerback on the Patriots isn't used as heavily as a third cornerback on another roster. But I do see him, you know, fighting for that third cornerback spot on the roster or not on the roster, but, you know, uh, in game situations. But he's going to have to fend off Jason McCourty. He's going to have to fend off. Eric Rowe, Jonathan Jones, some other talented cornerbacks. So right now I would probably guess that, that Stephon Gilmore, Jason McCourty, and Eric Rowe would be the top three cornerbacks. But Duke Dawson certainly has a chance to compete with either McCourty or Rowe for, for one of those spots. Speaking with the one and only Doug Kide, Patriots columnist and beat reporter for Nesson and Nesson.com. Hey, everybody, I want to tell you about a new wellness brand for men. It's called 4 hymns.com. 66% of men lose their hair by the age of 35. Thing is, when you start to lose your hair and you notice it, it's just too late. It's easier to keep the hair you have than to replace the hair you've lost. How will you feel a year from now if it's business as usual up there? I ask you, do you want a bald spot to pop up or 
Do you want to do something about it first? Well, there's a solution. It's called 4 It's a one-stop shop for hair loss, skin care, and sexual wellness for men. Thanks to science, baldness now can be optional. Hims connects you with real doctors and medical-grade solutions to treat hair loss. Order now. My listeners get a trial month of Hims for just $5 today, right now, while supplies last. See website for full details. This would cost hundreds if you went to the doctor or a pharmacy. Go to 4 slash trags. That's F-O-R-H-I-M-S dot com slash trags. T-R-A-G-S, of course. 4 com slash trags. Speaking again with Doug Kide of Nesson and Nesson.com. Doug, do you believe that the Patriots were serious about moving up to the two spot and grabbing Baker Mayfield if the Browns didn't take him? I kind of think so, but I can't. It, the amount that they would have to give up right. to move up to, to number two overall is just almost unfathomable. They would have had to give up both first round picks, both second round picks, and probably a future first as well. And I mean, that's essentially mortgaging the future for the future. You're 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 giving up so much potential, you know, young talent by doing that just to get a quarterback that. I don't know. It's a lot to give up, but if they really do, if they really did believe that Baker Mayfield was the guy, then I guess you could see it happening. And uh, I mean, everyone's saying that it happened. His, his agent said it happened. So I can only imagine that that was really a possibility. So, I mean, you and me are, we have a healthy dose of cynicism just because we <laughs> cover the Patriots and we cover the NFL and the thing that crosses my mind when I read this story is the Patriots probably were desperate to get their eyes on him, right? Because how many times have we read stories or even, you know, talked to Belichick and he's given an indication that, you know, we certainly like to get our eyes on as many players as we can, whether or not we wind up drafting them or not. Well, doesn't it, wouldn't it make sense that the Patriots tried to make it look sincere to get that meeting last week uh, with Baker Mayfield just so they kind of get a, get a better field of who he is as a quarterback. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely possible. And I, I definitely thought of that. That was one of the first things I thought of just because the Patriots, like you said, do like getting their eyes on people. Um, I'm just not sure if, if you'll, if you do that for an agent that, you know, you, you might need to work with again. And I guess, if he goes, they, they didn't have to deal with the, with the, um, the aftermath because Baker Mayfield wound up going first overall. So they, they didn't have to present the giants with this trade offer. I would have been interested to see, interested to see if Mayfield didn't go number one overall. And if the if the Patriots had no intention of trading up for him and then his agent sitting there saying, all right, then why'd you have to meet with them? if you weren't going to take him anyway. So I think that, I don't know, it's just, it's tough to say. I tend to believe that they were at least interested in doing so. I'm not sure if they would have actually done it, but if they really liked the quarterback, then maybe they would have been willing to do that. It's a ton to give up, but it is a quarterback. Well, I spoke with Steve Palazzolo last week on this podcast, and and he is totally sold, and the folks at Pro Football Focus totally sold on Baker Mayfield. I'm I'm not quite as sold, but obviously, look, I mean, they break down the film much more intensely um, than I do, and I just go with my naked eyes tell me in watching him at Oklahoma in, in a conference where the defense isn't that great. Um, I, I don't know. How do you read him? I, I like him and I like his accuracy. I think he was definitely the most accurate quarterback in the class. I, I I'm concerned a little bit of, you know, coming basically from a Mike Leach offense, uh, which is what they run there in Oklahoma because those quarterbacks haven't had a great degree of success in the NFL. But I think that Mayfield was a playmaker at Oklahoma. And I think that he was the most accurate quarterback in the class. And accuracy is usually something that you can't teach it at the quarterback position. So I think that that's why teams were so interested in him and why he did wind up going number one overall, just because the other quarterbacks in the class just didn't have that same accuracy. Well, by the way, what did you think of Danny Etling? I, now, now uh, you don't have him making the initial 53-man roster, but there's a big, um, obviously, uh, asterisk associated with that, and that's because you don't see him 
you know, performing as a seventh round pick uh, or late round pick, I should say, uh, to the degree where he would be plucked off the waiver wire and you see him getting onto the practice squad. So let, let's make that clear. But um, what do you think of Danny Etling? Uh, I didn't love the pick. And basically anyone that I talked to who, you know, knows more about Danny Etling than me probably liked the pick even less than I did. Uh, there's a, there's a lot to say about the fact that he didn't turn the ball over, but it also seems like he basically ate sacks rather than throw, throw interceptions. He was, he was terrified to throw interceptions. So he just eat sacks or, or, you know, make another dumb decision instead. So I don't know. Um, I think that there was reason to believe that it could work out just because he's working with Tom Brady's throwing coach and his mechanics were one of the biggest knocks coming out of college for him. So you know, the fact that he is working with Tom House, maybe he gets his mechanics corrected, and maybe he comes into camp as a completely different quarterback. And in that situation, then, yeah, the Patriots probably saw some upside there, knowing that he is working with Tom House. But if he comes in as the same guy that was at LSU, then I, I can't really imagine him having too much success in the NFL. Was there one pick that surprised you more than any other by the Patriots? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I guess it was Etling, just because I, I thought the Patriots would address the quarterback position earlier, but they kind of pro- proved that they had no interest in any of these other quarterbacks except for, you know, maybe Mayfield, because they had the draft capital to trade up into the top 10 for, for Josh Rosen, and maybe they tried to, and the Raiders didn't want to trade in conference to let the Patriots get their future quarterback. Maybe they were more comfortable trading with the Cardinals, but they they didn't trade up for Josh Rosen. They didn't draft Lamar Jackson twice in the first round. They skipped over Mason Rudolph, I believe it was like three times in the second round. They skipped over Kyle Loretta. They skipped over Luke Falk. And many times they were trading picks right before these quarterbacks were coming off the board. So not only were they skipping these quarterbacks, they were actively not picking instead of taking these guys. The only quarterback who went off the board, you know, 20 or 30 picks after the Patriots had a selection was Mike White out of Western Kentucky, who I thought was kind of an intriguing pro- prospect. But I mean, if the Patriots had really liked him, then they easily could have taken him with, you know, one of their picks before they traded out or that fifth round pick that was used on, on Juwan Bentley. I almost hate to do this, but you know I gotta have to do this, Doug. Uh, the latest in the Tom Brady saga. I, I, I don't want to spend too much time on whether what your reaction was to him pleading the fifth when Jim Gray asked him whether or not he felt uh, appreciated. Uh, but what kind of stuck stuck out to me is Brady acknowledging this week that he wishes Malcolm Butler had played in the Super Bowl. To me. He would in years past. He would never have said that. That is an indication to me that he's kind of ticked off and kind of speaking out his mind more than ever. Yeah, I would agree. I thought that uh, Ben Bowen of the Boston Globe wrote something uh, pretty smart on Brady. Uh, the, I think it's coming out tomorrow in the Globe where Brady's really kind of playing by his own terms this off season. If that means you know talking about Malcolm Butler, that means talking about Malcolm Butler. If that means you know, not showing up for off-season workouts, and that means not showing up for off-season workouts. If that means, you know, taking these different opportunities to address the media, then that's taking these other opportunities. It means hanging out with the family. So that's what it really seems like. It seems like Brady isn't the same, you know, maybe not the same team-first guy that he's been in the past this off-season. And that's not saying it's a bad thing. I think that he's acting like a normal player, but it is a different Brady that we're seeing. Doug, how can people follow you? Uh, on Twitter, at Doug Kide. Follow me uh, there. Follow Nesson at Nesson.com uh, for all of our Patriots coverage. And shoot me a follow on Instagram if you're on there as well. Uh, it's not really sports-related, but we do some fun stuff on my Instagram. Uh, you also, uh, A, have a wonderful family, uh, but B, you have some uh, great uh, musical uh, Instagram posts. So I think you're a must-follow on Instagram. Thank you. I appreciate that very much, Greg. Yep. Uh, And you know I mean it. (laughs) Of course. Of course. (laughs) Thanks again, everybody, for downloading today's Patriots Beat. Want to once again thank our terrific guest from Nesson.com, Doug Kide. You can follow him on Twitter, as he just said, at Doug Kide. You can also give us a follow at Patriots uh, CLNS and also at CLNS Media. 
course, give my own personal account a follow, if you will, at Trags, T-R-A-G-S. Today's sponsor, 4 For Patriots, content manager Mike Alonji, CLNS media executive producer Larry H. Russell, the founder of the network, Nick Gelso. Thanks to everyone who tuned in. This is Mike Petralia, and this is the Patriots Beat Podcast, powered by CLNS Media. What's going on, Pass Nation? This is Marvin Zahn of the CLNS Media Network, and I'm here to tell you right now to check out the CLNS Media New England Patriots postgame show hosted by myself and my co-host, Mr. Mike Nice. And live on CLNS Radio immediately after every single Pass game, call in at 929-477-2386 toll-free to get your voice heard and contribute to the host breakdown and analysis of the latest Patriots contest. We also got the stars and sorries of the day, Twitter posts for the plays of the game, and everything else that is going on with the five-time Super Bowl champion. Subscribe to CLNS Media New England Patriots Post Game Show on iTunes and Stitcher and the best way, download the free CLNS Media Network mobile app for on-demand listening anytime, anyplace, anywhere. <laughs> 